Hey everybody, this is Wayne Dorban and Nick Burton, and we got Mark behind the glass, and we are coming to you live from northern Colorado and Texas, and Mark is in Bangladesh. And we are excited today to have Nick with us because Nick's going to uh, give us an amazing presentation about his farming activity and his marketing. And really, that's one of the things that a lot of us can use is some help with our marketing. So I'm going to just do a little bit of an interview. Say hi, Nick, to everybody. Hi, Wayne. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you. Nick and I met uh, through the through the internet probably about a month ago as I actually heard from somebody about an event that he was going to be doing and we'll talk about that a little bit more later but it is later this month and it's an online event um, called State of the Soil and I reached out to Nick and, and uh, thought that what he was doing was interesting um, even as we got to talking to each other I think at least I felt like it was even more interesting and I felt like it would be great to get him on here to do uh, one week or two week and he's agreed to do two for us he's going to do a session today and he's going to actually follow it up and we'll do one next week so next week's on Tuesday and if you've registered for this session you're also registered for the one on Tuesday so you do not have to register again and he'll get as far as he gets today and we 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 booked as much as two hours if he wants to go that long but we usually we usually try to keep it in that hour hour and a half range so um, we're going to go, let him go in just a little bit, but first I just want to interview him just a little bit, let you guys learn a little bit about him. So Nick, tell us, tell us about kind of how you got into this whole agriculture thing and tell us a little bit about your history that way. The getting into hydroponics, getting into farming was almost an accident. We, um, I always wanted to have a retail nursery and I had been in the property management side of the industry for a long time. I uh, put myself through college doing it. Uh, started mowing on the side and getting bigger and bigger throughout the years. Uh, but as my knees started to deteriorate, my arthritis started to kick in, uh, I knew I needed another revenue stream, uh, maybe something not as physical. Uh, and I always enjoyed going to the nurseries and I thought, well, that's another great way that I can buy them at a wholesale level and supply my property management. And it was, it was just a good fit. And I called, I called Grower Supply and ordered my greenhouse and just at the very end on the side, um, you know, they have all this hydroponic equipment and I ordered a 48 hole hydroponic table as a novelty for people to come out to the nursery, just something a little different. And um, we got to talking about that, I, we mow for a lot of restaurants and as soon as I mentioned this hydroponic table, the, the questions actually, actually became were asked of me, hey, can you grow us some herbs? Can you grow us this, that? And I think, well, maybe I should order another one of these tables and, <laughs> and just see what happens. Well, as the weeks progressed, and I'm, and I'm talking about a couple of weeks here, uh, it all happened very, very fast. Uh, four or five restaurants either heard about it or we just came into contact and they're like, can you grow for us? Can you grow for us? And uh, I called. The supplier back up and I said hey I, th I think we're going to expand and we ordered uh, a 600 hole unit and then the reality of I don't know what I'm doing here set in <laughs> and I called up and I was like I need some training I need some help um, this kind of took a, a turn I wasn't expecting uh, but I'm one of these kinds of people I'm, I'm always open to new ideas and new revenue streams and we had we have the room I'm on at the time I was on 32 acres uh, I since sold off uh, quite a bit, but I'm still sitting on almost four acres right on the highway in Paris and I have a, a large warehouse of 50 by 100 and uh, plenty of room to expand. So I went up, took their school and by the time I left the, the school we had, we had expanded to about 2,500 holes of production and um, we got it coming in and ordering and we started building our indoor grow room and adding on to our greenhouse. Uh, at the same time that we were opening up this retail nursery. So it was a lot of activity, very exciting at the time. Um, and over the, the t first two years of having the nursery open, farming permeated everything that we did and it was so, um, it was just so steady that we decided to close the nursery up altogether and take all that existing infrastructure for watering plants and maintaining ornamentals and expand our grower area. So we closed down to the public, 
Uh, it saved me a ton of money on labor and having to continually staff this ornamental nursery. I didn't have to have a gigantic inventory, and it just seemed to work. Um, backing up a little bit, there's a there's a two there's a two month window in Texas. It's basically from the beginning beginning of March, depending on the weather, to Mother's Day, and that's where everybody in our town does all the ornamental stuff and plants their gardens and gets out and about. The first year was great, and the second year we ordered all this inventory and, and really bulked up, and then the rain started, and it just rained and rained and rained and rained for the entire spring. So we missed our window, and then we're sitting on all this inventory. And because people weren't coming out to buy um, all these ornamental plants, we're also missing sales on all, of, all this excess salad mixes that we were developing and making and all these tomatoes that we had because nobody was coming out. So that, that second year we decided to, hey, let's, let's go ahead and, and make up some salad mixes, do a little bit of added value and offer delivery to whoever wants deliveries. Well, the problem was we needed to have like a like a minimum order to make it worth a while, you know, because we were still having to stop uh, to keep people in house to run the nursery in case somebody came out, and it just it flopped, totally flopped, and it got to be about August, and I remember very very specifically the day that it all just seemed to crumble down. We had all this inventory that we we're still sitting on from spring, and we were throwing away very leggy annual flowers and bags of compost and mulch were getting sun eaten and we we're, were just really going down the, the tube there for a little bit that, that second year and it just seemed like that I was just at the very very bottom of, of what I could tolerate as far as are we going to stay in business or are we not and it was almost like we hit rock bottom and that's the day I decided to call up a, a vendor friend of mine who had mentioned a mastermind group in Dallas and I got involved with that and that's when everything started just kind of changing and I started looking at my industry and my business from outside of my own shoes, outside of my own vision and really got into self-development and business development and realized that word of mouth was no longer going to be enough to do it and I pretty much spent the last three years really dialing in, doing deep dives on how social media marketing works, uh, the power of the internet, getting away from traditional advertising, uh, understanding where word of mouth fits in and, and how to make that better whenever it does happen and just how to streamline a business and run everything a hell of a lot better. So that's, that's what we did and that led to the development of Victory Lunch Club. Victory Lunch Club for us is our main engine that drives sales for for the nursery. And I still own the property management company, but I have somebody else that runs that for me, and and we have you know separate separate streams and and separate businesses there. The Victory Lunch Club just removed all of the barriers that people were putting up in front of us. Whenever we would ask, you know, what, why are you, you know, what can we do to for you to come buy our, our salad mixes? And it, at the time, we were not going to the farmers market because really we were just strung so thin. I mean we, we were I was still having to deal with the, the mowing company, I was still growing, uh, we were starting to do some speaking engagements and I was just wore, wore very thin. And um, it was almost towards the end of the market season and I didn't want to come in halfway uh, without a plan because I hadn't looked into it because we were used to people coming to us until the rains happened. So we, we asked, you know, what, what's the barriers? Well, we can't find enough people in our office that want to take a delivery. We can't meet the minimums. Uh, once we have it, you grow so much stuff that we've never heard of, we don't know what to do with it. Um, when we would deliver, we would have to wait on them to go out to the car to get their purse. Uh, somebody would have to go find the person within the office, and it was just very, very tedious for a small amount of, of money. So we, we sat down and we looked at, all of the barriers that were preventing people from either coming out or from ordering or from buying from us and we eliminated those barriers. We made it uh, a subscription based model. Everything we do now goes through a commercial kitchen that we had built on site 
And I'm going to right now dispel the myth that having a commercial kitchen is like the most hardest thing in the world. That's what we hear all the time. Well, there's all these permits and licenses and this and that. And well, yes, there is, but it's really not that expensive. And it's when you're able to compound how much more you can make off of your harvest, it, it pays for itself very quickly. And used restaurant equipment is numerous and you don't need a big, big room. We do all of our salads in a 12 by 14 room and we designed it specifically for mass producing salads all at, all at one whack. So we made it automated. You signed up over the internet uh, through our webpage. It's a very simple system and we almost had to put restrictions on on people because we only make one salad a week. Now to this day, months, yeah, actually going on a year and a half now, we've never made the same salad twice, the exact same salad. Uh, we definitely have variations of crowd favorites, but every single month, or every single week, I'm sorry, we, we harvest something different and we bring in uh, food different. So we're a farm restaurant kind of hybrid. Obviously we can't grow everything. I mean, I'm not a cheese producer and, and we need nuts and we need, uh, we make most of our dressings, but we still need olive oil and bases and kind of things like that. So we, we are a hybrid restaurant, farm to table restaurant, but it, I will not let a salad go out unless it's like 80% of our own grown stuff. So fruit and crops, herbs, um, cut flowers, all, all these things, edible flowers, I'm sorry. Uh, and a lot of greens at any one given time we have I'd say 32 varieties of plants being grown inside of our indoor grow room so we have a big variety of things that we can offer uh, and we plan the salads out during our seeding um, I'm a foodie the girl that works for me she's a big foodie works had worked in restaurants uh, I like to eat at these kind of restaurants so I'm, I'm constantly looking for inspiration and coming up with 50 salad recipes a uh, a year is a little challenging at times and uh, especially given some of the, the growing problems that you encounter mm -hmm. pest infestations and drought and flood and it, it gets pretty interesting sometimes and people are really surprised even though we do plan out our plantings and we can within a couple of weeks know when something's coming up often we don't decide what next week's salad is until the Friday before so as people sign up for Victory Lunch Club, it works like this. They sign up, we get an, a confirmation email, they get a confirmation email back saying, yes, everything's fine, or hey, we need a little bit more direction, you know, whenever we're going to deliver if we, if we don't know where it's at. And Monday mornings they receive an email, like there's an email that went out today, and it describes what they're going to get. There's no pictures of that salad yet because we're still, we're still harvesting. Right now they're harvesting, uh, getting ready for it. And uh, this is the salad. There's no room for them to go, hey, can you make mine without this or can you add that? It's this is what you're getting. And it's a take it or leave it kind of thing. Um, interestingly enough, and the thing that fascinates me the most is, is anybody that maintains an email list, um, you really watch how many people open up your email to see how effective you are. But like 48% of the people open up these emails, which means over half of the people every single week have no clue what they're going to get as far as their lunch on Wednesday. Um, of, we, we keep it about 150 to 180 salads a week is, is what we take out. Um, it, it fluctuates up and down. Uh, typically December is when we have the most holds. We actually don't de deliver the week of Thanksgiving and depending on where the days fall, uh, we either we for sure don't deliver Christmas week, and sometimes we don't deliver the week after Christmas. Uh, a lot of that is predicated on when the schools go back into session because that makes up such a large portion of our Victory Lunch Club members. Um, and guys, as I'm saying this, I guess I should digress a little bit. I'm an open book here. You can ask me pretty much anything, and 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 I will share it. So there's there's a lot of little details here that would take two or three days to go into, so I'm, I'm just trying to give it to you, so if you do think of anything, go ahead and ask it. Um, so once they get once they get their email and they know what's coming, uh, we started doing add-ons, and the add-ons came 
when we started going to farmers market with our added value products like salads and pesto and hummus, uh, we noticed that most of our clientele at the farmers market were actually people that were on our VLC list, like 80%. So the people that are already buying from us were wanting more. So we made the uh, options most weeks where they can add a hummus that we make with our herbs and they, or they can order pesto that we're making with our greens and with our basil. Um, they can order extra vinaigrette, they can order a protein pack. Meat was one of those things I just, we didn't do for the first whole, whole year because I just, I couldn't imagine sending meat with my greens, right? I mean, we didn't have a way to cook it or anything like that, but we kept getting asked, we kept, kept getting asked. So we, we found a way to provide grilled chicken that was pre, it was pre-grilled and packaged, and we made that option available, and some people take it, and some people don't. The people that do take it, they love it, but it's an added sale. I mean, it's, it's in addition to the regular uh, salad that they get, but as part of that Monday email, they have to respond and say, we do an add-on. Uh, oftentimes, we will do some affiliate sales because we have this great sales pipeline that's on this subscription basis, and they're, they're wanting more. And I try to boost up my local economy, so we offer uh, different farmers and different local businesses an avenue to present their goods if, if they align with the farm-to-table thing that we're trying to do, and especially the local economy. Um, for instance, this week, there's a... Uh, there's a company that just recently opened up and, and they have the opportunity to order one of their protein uh, powders. And it's just a way to give them some exposure. So Nick Kelly asks, how do you package? So how do you package your salads and, and uh, your dressing for the yep, customers? Great, great, great question. That's, that's exactly where I was heading next. Um, so like I said, right now they're out there harvesting and uh, they're washing the, the greens. So the greens will sit in refrigeration overnight. Um, the dressings will get made typically on Mondays, and we use a, a four-ounce cup, like a solo cup. And then tomorrow we will set everything out. Like, like we'll have our greens in our sink ready to go. That forms the base. We'll typically have a herb or a garnish that's edible. Uh, the nuts, the cheeses, and they're all. We'll package those today, like we're grating. Uh, the cheese today, they'll get, get put in a cup, the dressings will get cupped, and then all of our containers are an eight and a quarter by eight and a quarter square box that's about two and a half to three inches deep. And so we just have a stack of containers and we start filling them up and they go down the line. Uh, once they get on the line, they go up to a table in the middle of the room uh, where the labels are put on. They're then put back in refrigeration and the next day we get up, load, and do our route. And the great thing about that is, is you know, Mon Monday they get the email, Monday and Tuesday their salads are picked fresh, so Wednesday as they get their delivery, our furthest delivery point is like 22 miles away, but most of them are within a four mile radius of the farm. So they're getting picked less than 24 hours, in May, 20, less than 24 hours from our farm and sent out into the public to be consumed that day, and it's not unheard of for for me to hear people, you know, they're they're eating these things seven to ten days out. I, lots of people will eat these things seven days in because they've never seen, they've never had anything that's fresh because it's right there and right there. Um, some people are able able to make these salads last two to three meals. I mean, there's they're packed in there. Some people eat them all in one. Some people take them home. We have. Uh, several offices that order for their entire office. So when you, you start looking at your route, I used to have that minimum drop off and now now we can I know if we can get in the building once, very quickly after that we'll get one or two people signed up because all of a sudden week after week we're establishing that trust and this relationship where now the coworkers see us coming in like clockwork, typically within ten or twenty minute window of delivery every single week and uh, and they're able to see that, and that, that trust factor is huge. Uh, respecting our list, respecting our clients, and, and I'll, I really like to throw in that we do have clients, we don't have customers. Um, I want everybody to put themselves in a position of, if I have a relationship with a business, am I a customer or am I a client? And what if you go to Walmart, you're a customer. 
you're, you're just another face in line versus you're a client. You know, we, we know about you. We know what's going on in your life. Uh, you're important to us and we're important to you. So there's, that's a big distinction. And if people don't want to make commodity type money farming, you need to quit treating yourself like a commodity. I mean, we're, we're a premium product. There's a lot that goes into this. And, and we kind of don't apologize for charging, you know, more than what you would typically do. But people aren't buying produce from us. They're buying that convenience. They're buying that done for you. Um, we ask people to go on a culinary adventure with us. I mean, every, can you imagine every single week trying to feed, you know, over 150 people within small town USA these artisan salads with stuff they've never heard of before, they've, they've never seen before, and they're trusting us to deliver something that they're going to like. Um, in our surveys that we send out, and I'm big on surveys because I want to know how we're doing, I want to know what the reception is. Uh, you know, some people say, you know, I don't like arugula or I don't like beets, but they, they've never not ordered because of it. You know, they simply eat around it. Um, our salads are meant to be eaten as a whole, so the dressings are meant to be paired with the greens. Some, you know, we all know that some lettuces are soft and some are a little more sturdy, and kale is certainly more sturdy than that. So we, we try to make a good balance of soft greens, sturdy greens. Uh, sometimes it's a sweet salad, sometimes it's a savory salad, sometimes it's a sweet and sour mix. Uh, we do themed salads where we'll, um, I, I'm big on Asian greens simply for the turnaround and the variety and the color and the shapes, textures and tastes, but that opens up us up to having, you know, a mandarin orange, mandarin orange salad with a ginger dressing or a sesame seed dressing. Uh, so we do get very, very creative with this. Um, I have multiple subscriptions to Edible Magazine because I want to know what the trends are coming up. I want to know what chefs are talking about and what interests them at the time. Um, back to the club. It's easier for me to get on a tangent about it because it's so. Who it, would have ever thought that a property manager would become a uh, you know a, a chef and a greens guy? Well, I you know, I, I grew up cooking for myself, you know. So I mean, food has always been uh, extremely important to me, especially fresh food. So it's you know you look at it's easy to pigeonhole myself, right? Am I just a guy that pushes a lawnmower, or am I a guy that owns a lawn mowing company that now can go on to other things? Uh, one of the things I learned through all that coaching and through the marketing was it took me 12 years to scale that business where I could walk away and leave it with a crew I could trust and have it run on the system. And it took me 18 months to be able to do the same thing with the farm through marketing, through systems. Um, I spend so much time away from the farm now. I mean, there's weeks that go by that, I, that I, I'm not even there and, and I don't deliver because of, of these other projects. Uh, and it's opportunities that I've made for myself, and it's because of systems. Um, the one last thing I'll say about Victory Lunch Club, and, and then we'll open it up to some questions, but uh, when I talk about how easy it is and automated, when we go drop these, these guys off, we, we walk in whatever door we know now to walk into, and we'll hand it off to the secretary, or we'll, we'll walk it right into the employee lounge and put it right in the fridge, and we're out of there. And we don't have to collect money and we don't have to worry about who's not there or, or anything like that because the next day on Thursday, if nobody has any complaints, their credit cards are automatically charged. So we have weekly revenue coming in. Uh, we don't have to track down or chase our money. It's all automatic. Um, you know, and, and like I said, with, uh, with over half the people not even concerned about what we're going to bring them, they just trust us to always bring them something great. It's... Um, we have a huge trust factor with our clients, and we really respect that. And I think that we're the same. So super. We well, let's do this. Um, we got one more question. Uh, I think you've probably already answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. Which is, you've got of those 150, 180 clients. Are any of them either businesses or restaurants, or is it all individuals? No, no, we, uh, that's a huge thing. It's, it's easy to skip these things. I just live it every day, but it's, we only deliver to offices. We made that's that what just, I thought. We, that's, we, that's what we, I thought. So. Um, there's, there's always somebody at the office to deliver to versus if we, if we also deliver to homes, uh, I forgot to put the cooler out. I'm not going to be there that day. Hey, I'm at work. So 
when you deliver to offices, you're now you're just going down through major thoroughfares, and it cuts down the delivery time. Um, we're able to tighten up the route. So instead of zigzagging through all these different neighborhoods and residential areas, we're just going through, you know, commercially zoned places. So it tightens out the route. They don't necessarily have to be there. They understand that this thing is going to be fresh, even if they're not going to be there that day. And we can always get in the door. And then having that automatic payment also frees up their staff. Um, you know, there's a benefit to somebody telling their staff about what we do. You know, now all of a sudden you have personnel that's not leaving for lunch, they're not coming back late, they're not eating a burger and being tired all day long. Um, people are, you know, staying at work and eating better and eating healthier and, it, and it's no interference with the office because we're, we're just walking in, we put it in or we hand it to the secretary and nobody's having to worry about who's paid or who's not paid because this is, we, if we were to deliver five salads to five individuals in a in a business, we never have to bother the business because it's an individual thing, you know. So it's we only deal with the individuals. Well, I, I thought that was the case. So let's do a segue. I want to do what I call, and I actually copy this from a guy named John Lee Dumas, a lightning round, and I'm going to ask you about five questions where you know make them really pretty quick answers. He's not heard some of these. I have asked him a couple of them, but and then we're going to segue from that. Let you get right into doing some teaching about the marketing side of things. Yeah. Um, if it, and again, if you have questions, everybody put them up. Uh, Nick has said that he loves to answer questions while he's going. And again, he's not going to be done today. We're going to actually go another week after this, so don't worry about it. If he doesn't get through everything today, we're going to do this another week. So um, here's the lightning round. Um, I'll start with one that I've already said to you. Um, what tell us about a book you're reading right now um, that you really enjoy that could be of some value to others out there in our audience? So I I devour books, uh, uh, especially audio books, and I currently am rereading Mindless Eating by Brian Wansink. Um, Brian Wansink is a Cornell University professor, doctor, and they look at why people eat what they eat and how they consume it. So for me, selling in the food business, especially this time of year, it, it's a book I like to read at, at least once a year. But going into the new year, this this is when we pick up the vast majority of our new signups. Um, as I'm developing copy and, and writing my ads for my social media pages, I like to kind of delve back into and see and remind myself why people are eating what they're eating. Uh, and I have I've been reading. Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond for like the last five years because the book is, is so huge, um, and it's it's the it's my most favorite book I've ever read. It, it really goes down to the nitty gritty from societies starting farming and getting out of hunter gathering up through the industrial Re revolution, um, and that's one of the things that I really enjoy about agriculture is it's really shaped civilization as we know it through all these years it's such an old profession and there's so much to learn by going back and even looking at ancient systems so I've, I've looked at that okay. so you gave us two of them there everybody so repeat those again give us the first one again so mindless eating by Brian Wansink and, and the second guns germs and steel by Jared Diamond all right Mark would you throw those into the uh, chat box for us too all right here's the second one Let's pretend that you were 15 years old. Take yourself back to when you were a, a you know, middle teenager, and it's a beautiful day on a Saturday or Sunday, let's say, and you didn't have anything else you have to be doing. What would we find Nick doing? Uh, if I was 15, I was an absolute hoodlum. <laughs> I, I did not enjoy school. Um, what got me through school was band and art. Um, I was not in like a, a rock band or anything until much later in life, uh, but typically uh, me and all the all the rest of the, the drum line would hang out. Uh, if it was summertime, I, I could tell you we, we were just sitting on the porch and just having a good time. I mean, not really causing much trouble, but uh, certainly weren't angels either. So that, okay. that was how about that was fast forward? Thing. All right, fast forward till today. Same scenario. You don't have to do anything work wise. You just pretty much can take an afternoon to yourself. What will Nick be doing? 
<laughs> I'm, I've mentioned to you, you know, that's such a foreign concept to me right now. But uh, I, I, because I love what I, do, I mean, I really, really do love what I do. I would probably be working on something even if I didn't have to be. Oh, that. If, if, All right. If it was, if it was something our family had scheduled up and we could enjoy that time, that would be great. But if if they were doing something else, I'd I'd probably be reading or watching a video. I'll be honest with you, I'm a nerd. Okay. All right, two more. This one, um, this one's kind of tough sometimes, but. Think back and tell us about something that happened in your life that was negative at the time. You don't have to give details, but at the time it was really negative. But now you can look back on it and you can say, you know what? That really probably shaped me and helped me as much as anything that's ever happened. And you may have even said that earlier, but, but you talked about your transition. But yeah, I mean, tell us what that might have been. You know, that day I spoke of that was so detrimental, it really opened my eyes that even though I'd been in business for so long, we had made all these compounded mistakes that just really led us up to the point where we had to change what I was doing. Um, I mean, we we hit bottom multiple times, and as as an entrepreneur and as a farmer and as anybody that owns a business, you're going to hit rock bottom many, many, many times. But walking away from each one of those with a new perspective or insight or something that's going to get you through the next time that happens you're able to actually predict and see these things coming up on the horizon so um, you know I, I know my worst I've, I've had two worst days one was personal and one was business and, and we walked away from both of those with new perspectives on life so I, I, I think recognizing that hey I'm still alive you know through both of those and, and dealing with the consequences and the lessons learned that I don't know. I hope that answered the question, but just no, open it does. It, no, opening it yourself up to the lesson. One last, one last one, which is the opposite. Which is, what do you? What would you say is one of your biggest strengths that you use in your business, and why is that the case? I don't let anybody tell me that something's not possible. Um, if I have an idea and I believe it'll work, will I now have the resources so I can research it? Uh, and if if I can do the research and prove to myself that something makes sense, we're going to do. I mean, think about small town East Texas. I'm going to start a salad delivery business. Everybody said that was absolutely crazy, but it's changed my life and it's changed several people's lives because of it. So, uh, just I just don't take no for an answer, and I trust my gut. Good. Well, let's move into your teaching, man. Um, I know you've got some stuff to share on your screen, so you just take control of that and take your drink of tea there and go for it, my man. All right. Let me let me make sure we can do the screen share. And basically, as I as I get this up, I want everybody to realize that I knew my market at the time. I knew the problems, but I didn't necessarily know where they were. And I'm talking about the people, my, my clients, my future clients, and the people that I needed to get my uh, marketing in front of. So, I have a little tech issue here. Nope. <laughs> Promise we practice this, but it always happens. Where's that screen share button? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is Wayne. Wayne, do we still have? Give me a thumbs up. Do we still have audio? We do. We got audio, and you got a screen. You're good. You're good. I was. I had muted myself because of the wind gust, but okay. you're good. We got your screen, and we got you. Okay, so we. Okay. As this is this is my screen for my gardens. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through a couple of things. I wanted to find out, you know, who my customers were based off who was interacting on my page. And I want everybody to realize up from the get-go that this is, this is not the end-all, the be-all of market research, but this is a free tool that you can use 
from people that have a vested interest in you by signing up for, yes, I'm going to follow this guy. So this is one of the many, many things you can do for market research. So this is my page. Um, this is based off of 3,500 people within my area or within having interest in me follow my page. So these are all based off of 3,500 people. So let's look and see what kind of people are interacting with me. So we're going to go up there to insights. From this insights, we're going to go down to people. I don't know why this is there, but this is very, very close. Out of all the people that choose to follow me through social media, we're looking at over 80% are female-based, and the bell curve clearly shows that ages 25 through uh, 54 are my main people that follow us. Now, if you take a look at what we do, which is local salad production, that kind of makes sense because I don't... This this graph not only shows who is following us on Facebook, but it, it is a very, very clear representation of who we actually deliver to. Um, I think we deliver to less than 10 men total a week, and so like 95% or more of our clientele that actually take a subscription salad are female-based. They all fall within this bell curve. And then we need to step back and look at why would a 25 to 34 year old person buy a salad versus a 45 to 54? And this is this is where we kind of have to, you know, categorize people to some extent, but maybe still keep in mind that people are people and there's always a variation. But if you look at what the Nielsen ratings, you know, accomplishes for television, a very very small amount of people determine what's on TV. So this small audience here determines how we would talk, how we would form an ad, and how we would present our advertisements to the people that we want to sell to. Some people might be interested in the convenience, and that would be an ad. Some people would be interested in supporting a local farmer, and that could be an ad. Some people are interested in the nutritional value. These are all separate reasons that we're all taken care of within our company. So. Now we know, you know, within a pretty good idea of, of who our target audience that has chosen to follow us could possibly be. And we may want to know just a little bit more about those type of people. So as we're doing some market research, I'm going to write down women age 25 to 34, ages 35 to 44, and ages 45 to 54. I'm not going to, and I never have, with the exception of holiday ads around Christmas, because I want men to buy these subscriptions for their wives, but for the most part, 11 and a half months out of the year, we do not spend a dime on advertising to men. We don't craft ads for men. We, all, we craft our ads simply for women. So I want to know what's going on in the head and in, in, in the minds of, of the females within these ranges and then segmented down. Wayne, uh, if anybody has a question, feel free to just pipe in and, and stop me so I can answer. So where are we going to go find in where where are we going to find more information about these demographics? Well if you go up here to where this padlock is, there's a little drop down. And I'm going to drop that down. I'm going to go to manage ads. I'm going to go to my account, and from the Ads Manager button on these top three up here, I'm going to look at Audience Insights. And that's going to take us to this dashboard where I'm going to look at everybody on Facebook. Now, if you're in the United States, it automatically populates with the United States population, and this is telling us the 200 to 250 monthly active users, 250 million people are currently on Facebook. These are the demographics for everybody within the United States roughly for the last 28 to 30 days. None of this matters to me. None of these men, 
none of these age ranges except for this bell curve. So I'm going to start dialing that down. I'm going to switch it. And every time I make a change here, watch the audience change. So we're going to go from 200 to 250 million people. We're going to cut it to women only. Of course, it's going to drop by half. 100 to 150 million people. I'm going to set my age range at 25, and I'm going to go up to 54. Watch it drop. 60 million to 70 million active users. So within this range, what's going on, what's going on here in the minds of this segment? We're going to go look at page likes. There's the top 10, and it goes on and on. What these are the these are the top things that people are looking at on Facebook within my age uh, range and demographic. I know what they're watching. I know where they're shopping. I know who they're following. I know the products they're looking at and, that, and who they follow. Uh, fitness, children, uh, the companies that they're following, the clothing they're buying. The hair products, the authors, who are they reading, cookbooks, dieting books. From a farm standpoint, this is excellent because now if I'm, let's say I'm a market gardener and I had a farm stand, this is telling me that out of all those people that are on my Facebook page, they want recipes. They want something that is going to be a little healthier. Websites, Pepsi, Screaming Owl. Let's say we didn't know what Screaming Owl was. We'll click on it, and it'll it'll show you what these people are looking at and the audience. Two million five hundred ninety-three thousand people like this like this within my demographic. So what is Screaming Owl doing that's so important that two you know two point five million people are on their page? Well, then you can kind of do some research on them. Look, what kind of photos are they putting up? You know, how how are they marketing to their to their client? Ipsy, what's Ipsy doing? That's so important. Again, video, photos. You can look and see how they're crafting their ads, what they're doing, and then you can look. You know, Seventy-four comments. 250 engagements, and as you dive deeper, uh, for the sake of time, we won't go too deep into it, but as you dive deeper, you can see how many people share it, you know, and if you have one post from a company that was within your age, you know, demographic range, see, what, see what's going on, and you're going to start seeing patterns of how people make their copy, how people present their businesses, and, and how that can affect and drive your sales and what you put, put out there. You know, kids, Food Network, it, it goes on and on. There's there's just a whole list of things that you can look at that will, again, just market research and insights. Page likes, you know, the top ten page likes in this audience. Where are all these people located? You know, it's it's going to start showing you where out in the country that your your people are active. You can go in here and see how many times and what devices they're on. Why? Why is it important? Uh, what What they're on? It, depending on how you make your ad, sometimes it looks better on desktop. Sometimes it looks better on mobile. If your demographic is on desktop more than they are on mobile, you know that that could change how you set up your your marketing. Gives you a look at their household, how much money they make, do they own their home. You know, if you if you had a home inspector, but I mean, this is I'm gonna try and throw some things out that are relevant in other areas, other than just what we're doing. But if if you had somebody that was setting up gardens for somebody or property management, do my people own their home or are they renting? You know, that that's something that could be important depending on your service. How many people are are in their house? How much are their houses worth? Are you selling to people that are more affluent and have a little bit more more money to spend, or do you need to concentrate on people where you can show them the value of your product and how you can save them money? 
Are you selling something prestigious? Or are you selling something with an economic factor? Either way is fine as long as you're making a profit and as long as you're talking to the right people in the right tone. Um, this one's great. How are they spending their money? How does, why is this important to me? It's because I spend a lot of time on Facebook groups, especially farm to market groups and, and growers, and the question comes up almost every week, should I accept a credit card? You know, 95% of the people here and 90% are, are paying with some type of card. You know, that, that's huge, that's huge, huge. And when we do our market surveys for our own farmer's market, uh, that I, I, I run our social media for our town, and then through our own, we've proven that people want the ability to use their card. Uh, some people will say, well, I don't want to give up the 2 to 3% that it's going to cost to run the card. But what they're failing to recognize is you're, you're pushing 60 to 90% of the people away that want to spend money with you. Uh, the people that are at the market that simply can't or won't or will never take a credit card, that cash could go to them and then you can take the credit card strengthening your entire market and I can guarantee you because I see it time and time again the people that shop with a credit card with us at farmers market spend considerably more than people that are just buying cash so that that little tangent there but that's why that's important and all this is great right but it still doesn't help me figure out how am I gonna talk to my audience in a more segmented fashion so we're gonna we're gonna go back to the demographics. So what is the difference between a 25 and a 34 year old, and on the extreme of 45 to 54 year old? Still gonna keep it women, but we're gonna dial that age down to 34. We're gonna go back to page likes. This is a little time consuming and tedious. I really like to look at what they're watching, what they're reading, and how they're consuming their media, what magazines they're reading, that kind of thing. So if you're at a younger crowd, one of the other things that you can look at is let's see how far this is going to go down. I mean, you can see how much information is already here for free so that's where they like that's what they like back to the demographics they have this lifestyle section these lifestyles you kind of got to take them with a grain of salt and do some interpretations but females ages 25 to 34 career career building children and you can click on here and kind of see a little snapshot of how they spend their money, how much they're making, what are they doing. A lot of these are kind of uh, gray area type lifestyle choices and this is all based off of what your audience is, is, is cli uh, clicking, liking, and engaging on Facebook. So if 7%, which is again out of a long list of people, but that seems to be the, the largest one, especially out of the top 10, are career builders, how are you going to talk to a female 25 to 34 building her career? You're going to sell her on convenience. You are going to sell her on nutrition, doing something for her, adding value to her nutritional and eating plan. You really don't talk, have to talk about how much this thing costs because these are extremely busy, extremely ambitious people. Um, and you can get in there 66, 12% postgraduate. Where are they working? Sales, administrative, you know, personal care, health and medical, that's some of the top ones. So these people are making a little bit of money and they have a little bit of a discretionary income. I can guarantee you that they're spending, you know, anywhere from five to ten dollars a day on coffee or drinks. Uh, so selling them a premium salad that's done for them, especially in my uh, within my realm, kind of makes sense. So let's go the opposite way. Let's look at 45 to 54. And how do things change? Page likes. 
Weight Watchers, Women After 50, Health, Travel. Now all of a sudden we are, you know, we're able to look in and see what kind of copy, and anytime I talk about copy, I'm talking about how you're writing your, the words that you use for your marketing and, and for your engagements on Facebook. So what is Taste of Home doing? You know, what is what are these people doing to get the attraction? Healthy Food House, let's take a look. Two million people within this age demographic like this. Well, what are they doing that's so engaging? It's all kind of repetitious. We've got graphs, we've got nice pictures, we've got you know, just content that is meant to add value to these people. What kind of what kind of engagements are we getting? Five thousand likes, sixty-two comments, one thousand, you know, almost two thousand likes, twenty-eight comments. And as a small business, you're going to be really excited if four thousand people like your post and 191 people comment on it. Now likes don't put money in your bank account, but 191 engagements is 191 times that you can actually talk to an audience and build a relationship, a long-term relationship with somebody that if you're going to be in business long-term is going to be crucial. You don't want customers, you want those clients. You know, So you can kind of take a look, not copy what they're doing, and I'm, I'm really going to, one of the things I always like to tell people is you don't have to go out. These are this has all been created, right? This is all somebody took the time to make this versus what are we doing? Instead of creating content, we're documenting our life. This is this is what's happening at Victory Gardens. A little lost. There we go, photos. So if you'll notice, I don't use anybody else's pictures. These are all pictures from my farm, something somebody said. These are I, This is all stuff that we grew. Now, the photography is great because I've spent time on it. But these are my vines. These are my potato, uh, tomatoes. These are my microgreens. These, this is my shisho. This is my grow room. You know, these are all things. These are, I went around town, uh, on Shop Small Saturday and took a picture of the activities that were happening around my town and I highlighted other small businesses because I'm part of this community and I'm trying to build up my community. These people were shut down on Saturday. So these people owning these businesses didn't have time to walk around and take pictures so I did it for them and I shared them on my group. It helps them, it helps me. We showed people in our community. We showed people working. You know, all of these are my photographs. All of these are my descriptions of what we're actually doing on our farm. We had a drone come out and do some before and after uh, work of our high tunnel. Um, and it's just, we get to show people where their food comes from in a way they've never seen it before, ground level. You know, I'm, you know even, even though I'm big on pictures, sometimes I do make my own. These are our employees. These are our cut flowers. There's a picture I took going to work one morning, you know. And look, do I have the engagements? Absolutely not. But I also don't have two million followers, so there's there's just something to be said about scaling that that up. But you can tell the difference between using our own pictures. You know, this is of New York, but this is a picture I took when I was in New York. But I was reminding you know Paris that you know through their help we were able to go do all these things. These are. These are a filter I used. This is us preparing our seed beds and planting the crops that you see up here. So people can see the progression of where their food comes from. I apologize for scrolling too fast. Um, this is at our market. I'm showing people what they're missing. This is a this is another one of our affiliate programs where we, where we, we staged and took pictures of somebody else's product that we were selling for them. We're reminding people that our affiliate place that we sell salad at is stocked. We're showing people their seeds coming up, you know, so that there's our dressings that we made. And that, that goes on months back. But don't be afraid to look at your own insights, which is right here. You know, reach, likes, 
look, don't get don't get discouraged if one day you put up something and get three or four people, you know, unlike your page. You know, don't get caught up in that. Just keep doing authentic, true content. I don't. I, I really suggest not reposting. And if you do repost something, put your put your spin on it. Um, don't be afraid to get in here and look at things. Don't be afraid to look at the people that are buying from you, and then go up there again. That little drop down will get you to manage ads. Get you to those three bars, audience insights. And get us back to where we started. Now, what if you're saying, well, Nick, I don't want to look at everybody in, in the entire world. Uh, I'm in Washington State, and that's completely different than Florida. That's absolutely correct. So, I'm in Texas, very close to Dallas. I know that. 25 to 54 is my ray age range women so now I'm going to start putting in watch these numbers drop Dallas Texas Fort Worth I'm using an area that I know very well Allen and my surrounding towns, Paris. These are these are regional things that are going to take. I'm going to take into consideration. Um, you know, in Florida, some people are still producing. Cut flowers are going to come in at different times. Different vegetables are going to come in at different times, depending on what you sell. If you do Bath and Body, and I don't know what everybody does here, but you can always go in through your demographics, through your area, and see what people are looking at. So within all these towns that are close to me, that's how big my audience of my age range, of my gender, that's how big, that's how big my market is. We can go and look at specific, specifically what they're liking. Of course, it's more regional. We can see where they're consuming their news. So let's say you wanted to do traditional media and you had that kind of budget. Most of us don't. But which, which radio stations are they looking at the most? Where are they spending their weekends? Um, you know, what are they doing on, on a regional level? Where can you reach these people? So that's the other pages that they're looking at. If the number one magazine, local magazine, is D Magazine, I mean, that's something that you're going to want to know. I want to show you something else. We have our demographics. We have our area, 60,000 to 70,000. But what if I just wanted to talk to people I'm trying to auto populate this? People at the farmer's market. Okay, now it, it dropped down the population so much. I think earlier it said that this was unavailable for whatever reason. So they may be doing a little maintenance on it, of course, while we're doing this. But farmers markets. Permaculture. I might put in whole food. Something sketchy with this because a lot of times it auto populates. From the table, yeah, some something, something's glitchy on here. I'm gonna I'm gonna back it out of my areas. Let's see if we can get get it back up so you can take a look. So, if you use the entire United States, and, and I do promise you, once you put in that stuff and everything's not glitchy, it'll come up for your area, but Farmers markets, permaculture, if that's what your main business is, and this is your demographics, this is what those people are looking at. Permaculture magazine, sustainable living and design. All these are just tools to help you understand on a broad level what everybody is looking at.
one last little thing before we turn it over to questions and please hit me up on a lot of questions. Let's go back to Facebook. Another great way to look at a market is this search box. And let's say you were going to go to farmer's market for the first time next year or you wanted to revamp your farmer's market stand. So farmer's market. It's going to take you to this main page. So one of the things you can look at is groups. And you can go within these groups and I would pick one with a thousand members or more, join the group, and look and see what people are talking about. And these are people that are at market, these are people selling at market, or fixing to, and look, people are responding to our ad. It works. Um, but, but these are places where you can get tips from people either buying at farmers markets, running farmers markets, or selling at farmers markets. So join the group, read what's going on, or you can look at photos. I want to see pictures of farmers markets and what appeals to me. I want to get different ideas. So this is a little bit more research. They could, a lot of, you know, look, a lot of it's garbage. You know, I really like this that comes up, this map, because that's, like I said, I, I helped run the, the social media account for our farmers market. Number one question we get asked, where are you? So these people have created a little map. Excellent. You get pictures of farm stands, you get pictures of displays, you get pictures of signage, you get pictures of how people present their material before the market, you get pictures of coupon ideas, you get pictures of copy ideas, um, these little explainer videos, trainer videos. These are all just, think about 20 years ago, nobody knew what, what was going on in the market, you know, the next state, the next town you know, across the country, and people were kind of limited by, to their ideas, but now you can follow other people's markets. You can follow people's pictures and see and get these ideas of stuff that you may have never seen or considered before. You can watch videos of people at their farmer's markets and events that they're having and, and what they're doing. Again, just uh, pe people's another, a lot of these uh, are just different. Uh, pages of farmers markets that you can look at and get ideas from. So now you know your demographics, now you know what other people are doing, and you have a better idea of kind of what's going on within uh, within the market. And that, I hope that helps, and that's just that's just a very, that very, very... That was know, awesome. Tip of that iceberg. Everybody, yeah, Nick, that was just great. Um, he's going to go back to his screen. Why don't you guys throw in some questions. I know you've got some. This was probably heavy duty for some of you. You've not seen this maybe so much before. Um, others of you have. So throw in some, some, some questions for Nick. Throw in some comments. Throw in some ones if you thought you learned some of that. If you learned something there, put some ones in for me, would you? And if you've got still some questions, maybe put some fours or fives. And next week we'll, uh, we'll make sure that Nick gets to some of those things. Got lots of ones coming up, Nick. Lots of them. Um, really, really interesting. Thank you. One, one, one. Thank you, everybody. That's the way you uh, apply. So, Nick, I've got a question. While well, you guys, they have to type, so it takes sure. a second. Um, for your business, um, how often do you post? So, how many, how many times a week you were showing the screen? It was kind of quickly. Do you have a, do you have a, a schedule that you use? And how often do you advertise? So that's a great question. When I get that's probably the question I get asked the most. Here is my here is my rule of thumb for how often you post. We're at the farm every single day, right? We're surrounded by it. It's it's our world. If I walk past something at my farm and I think it's neat or it grabs my eye, I'll take a picture. Um, we have we have this phone with this 24 hours a day that has more production value than all the TV stations combined as little as 20 years ago. So within a matter of 30 seconds, I can walk past something, take a picture, edit it, and send it out to thousands of people depending on what platform I'm on. All across the country, I can segment it down to my audience. If, if I think it's neat, I put it up. Uh, of course, on Fridays, I'll put up a market report where I talk about exclusivity. 
hey, we only have X amount of this. It's going to be this price and uh, this variety, and here's a picture of it. And what you can see is we keep, we keep everything in coolers at our farm stand for the most part. And when you see a car drive up to the market, park, they get out of the car and they walk directly up to you without looking at our sign go, I want two of these, three of these that you talked about last night. You know what's working. Yeah. They, they get their stuff. They'll swipe their card. They'll probably buy something else. They may go see another vendor and then they leave. So there, there's two things to think about that. Did that post drive traffic to where I wanted to drive at the market? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's timely. So on Friday night, they got all night to think about it. It reminds them to come to the market the next day. I'm not putting up stuff for market anywhere near you know, the end of Friday. And then we put it up again Saturday morning. Hey, we're setting up a market. Don't forget to come see us. They come see us. By me doing my own marketing and driving people to my booth, it strengthens the entire farmer's market. And everybody should be so lucky. If, they, if, if every farmer's market, every single vendor did their own marketing, how much more traffic would that entire market get? How would that strengthen the economy of that, of that local market? So is it something you have to spend all day on? Absolutely not. I mean, with practice, I was interviewing somebody, and I was taking some behind-the-scenes uh, pictures, and we were walking from one location to the next. He gets a ding on his phone, and there's a picture of us like two minutes ago that just went out to thousands of people and goes, how'd you find time to do that? We were just walking down the road, and, and yeah, I, I had something in my hand, and I was doing it, but I do it not many, many, many times a week for years on end. Does it take a whole lot of time out of my day? People are, are going to argue that. You know, Why are you spending all this time on, on Facebook? Well, because I've built my entire business on Facebook. Right. You know, I've, I've built a national presence on Twitter and Instagram. So does it work? Yeah, because that's where everybody's at right now, uh, especially your buyers. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't have to worry about where this stuff is going because it's so targeted. So to answer your question in a very long answer, um, well, if, yeah. if something's relevant, if something's newsworthy, it's really, don't do just put yeah. something up for the sake of putting it up. There may be two or three days that go by I don't put something up. But if if something's relevant, right. if something's timely, if, if there's an event coming up, that's when it goes up. So I don't really have a tried and true uh, formula as far as scheduling. Now I do have a scheduling um, tool that you can use, but as far as how often I post, post something up is when it's relevant, when it's newsworthy, and wherever I think we can make an impact on my, on my, custom, on my clients. Good. Before we, and there's a couple other questions I'm going to get to them, and you guys throw some others up there if you've got them, but I want to throw something out before we get to that, and that is that Nick has got something very cool coming up, and again, he's going to be with us next week, but I want to talk just briefly about it, and we mentioned it at the start, and that's a, an event, an online event that he's hosting, and he has spent a lot of time help getting ready for it, and there are going to be um, a I don't know, 20 or more amazing guests that will have and giving speed talks. And it's four days long from the 23rd to the 27th of, of January. It's called State of the Soil. And Nick's going to, he's already given us some things, and you're going to see it on your website, some banners we can use. You guys can help market for Nick. And you can also get a discount on the, what he calls the All Access Pass. It's free, actually, to watch the streaming live. But if you want to get, um, replays, um, there's a cost. That that discount just for us that he's made up is Eco, is it 20? Is that what you said it was, Nick? So tell us again. What, what, ECO 20. And, uh, ECO 20. Yeah. yeah, ECO 20. Now that'll give you, um, as, as you pre-register, the, the before the event starts, the, the All Access Pass is 97. Of course, it'll go up during the event, but for early birds, it's ninety-seven dollars, but this will save anybody watching this right now an additional twenty percent. Plus, we're going to give you some codes that you can use to uh, to actually bring other people in and get a uh, affiliate from it. So we didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. Next week we'll do some more because it'll be very close to when the event starts. But what other questions? I've got one here from Marvin. Uh, this is a great question. What are the best types of Facebook ads? 
Because there are multiple types. Of people the, 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 ones, the ones that are going to be targeted to your client in a way that they're going to respond. Um, there's so many, and here, here's the other thing. You don't have to spend a ton of money. I would rather, instead of you doing a $20 ad, I would rather see you do four $5 ads and see which ones your clients respond to the best. So if you wanted to do a short video or if you wanted to do a photo carousel that links back to your site, all those tools that they have available, uh, a nice picture with some copy or just a blank post uh, where you're telling somebody something, test it. That, that, that's my... That's my advice, is don't, whatever you're wanting to spend or whatever your budget is, divide it by two or three. I always like to test things in three. Um, see what your audience is going to respond to the best. I will tell you that anything that has to do with video or photo is going to index higher. It's going to watch, watch, watch. So when people are looking at their screen, they're doing this, right, and that thumb is just flying. If you can stop somebody with a great picture or video, that's going to be what's most effective. That's the one I want you to do is test it, try it out, know that not one single ad is going to turn your business around. It's, it's a consistency thing. Social media marketing and advertising is a long-term relationship kind of thing. Um, is one going to give you way more traffic than the other? Yes, but there's nothing to discount that one that you put out that, that received a little bit of traffic because it's all a part of your narrative that as you can see, as I scroll through all my pictures, you, you got to see you know a lot of history of our farm over the last few months. And you can scroll that thing back three or four years to the day that we had our first tomato plant come up and to the day that we started building. So doing these things constantly and consistently is what's gonna what's gonna help. So uh, I, I do suggest testing. And that's <laughs> that's my final answer. Test it. Uh, Mark, by the way, has put into the chat, everybody, the, uh, that promo code. And again, it's stateofthesoil.com is the website for it. Um, so I think we'll, we might call it quits here today. Um, I actually told everybody before we started that uh, I've got a windstorm going on. And I'm a little distracted by it, and uh, it's a little bit a little dangerous. We've got hurricane force winds. Nick's going to be back with us next week. Be thinking of more questions. Get your and, friends to come on because you're going to learn more. And, and, and I, will uh, Nick, say, I, I will say, if, if anybody wants me to go over design work or, or whatever you want me to look at, like, like the, uh, the gentleman that just asked what kind of post, if you want me to walk you guys through the design program I use and how we craft an ad, I mean, that, that's a possibility. If you want me to talk about farmer's markets, I mean, uh, leave, I'm going to leave it open as to what we talk about next Tuesday. So you guys email cool. Wayne. Wayne, let me know, yep. and we'll come up with something based off what you guys want to know. Good. Well, Nick, this has been fun. I've learned a lot, and I actually do a lot of Facebook advertising, and um, some of the inside things that you showed were awesome. Looks like everybody else learned a bunch, too. And um, any other questions real quick before we jump off for the day? Again, we've got two more sessions today. We've got myself actually talking at 5.30 on on shrimp aquaculture, probably a little different topic than this. And then we have our Q&A later tonight, just to all everything. And we usually just talk about not so much about the speakers, but about just what our own questions are. We network, we put people on live. Last week we had a great talk about um, K-12 to homesteading information and teaching, and we talked about Trump systems and any number of other things. So try to get on that tonight. Um, very interactive. And then we've got seven more sessions throughout the rest of the week, and that's all on calendars that a lot of you, most of you have. If this is your first time on something like this, you'll actually get an email that will give you login instructions to the website where the replay for this will be. We'll have the replay up in about 24 hours or so. And Nick, thank you so much. You, uh, we sure enjoyed it, and um, we'll see you next week for another session. Well, thank and, and listen, everybody, anybody that's watching this right now that took time out of their day to make themselves better, that's what you have to do, and I appreciate the, the attention there, so thank you so much. Yeah, a bunch of people are saying thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for you guys showing up and uh, spending your time, and I'm going to stop the recording. And